is basically very cool. You send his brother, and uh, ask him to introduce his brother, and you call being able to do this one. Thank you. Right, the Mayor of Port Elizabeth, uh, Mr. Trollop, uh, Headmaster of Grey Junior, Mr. Lindsay Pearson, the Rector of Grey High, Mr. Chris Erasmus, and the Presidents of the Grey Union, um, Grey Foundation, the gentlemen who are the Chairman of the Boards of Governors. Um, great honor for me to be here today to introduce my brother, but perhaps in a little bit different way. Uh, to say a little bit about where we come from. Um, Port Elizabeth is a strong vein that runs through our family that is all over the world these days. A town that remembers the lady's prayers with its front to the southern seas, seas that brought our immigrant parents here in 1936 penniless. Port Elizabeth that afforded them refuge able then to build a life. I have a picture etched in my memory. I'm a six-year-old, lying in a darkened room, and I've got measles. And those that apparently that believe that you should darken the room and there's something to do the eyes on it. My mother is leaning over me, kissing me goodbye, and she said she's very important meeting. We had moved to Mill Park from where, I, from where I grew up in a small house in Clyde Street. Standing at the wall, the house was too small. Apparently, our parents' economic situation proved them available to buy a house in Mill Park. I had started my schooling from Clyde Street to Maris Brothers in Bird Street. And I hated every moment of it. It was a strict Catholic school, a wrap over the numbers, and then the literal wrap over the numbers. So my mom said, we'll move it to Mill Park and we hope you go to the gray. And then we came back very disappointed saying that the school is full. So what had she done? She had managed to arrange an appointment with Mr. Stanley Edwards, then headmaster of Gray Junior. And she was dressed in a finery. I have a clear picture of white gloves, a hat. And she was out to persuade Mr. Stanley Edwards her son should be admitted, and evidently she did a good job because um, I got into Gray Junior. Siblings followed him six years later, so I was anybody. So we lived in Linton Road. Linton Road in those days made us look gray. Very, very gray. On the right, the Glover family. Peter Glover, today, today an educationalist in Johannesburg. I visited some years ago. On the left, a family deeply rooted in the school, the Bands family, last night Nigel Bands, contemporary, my brothers, was awarded life membership of the Old Grey Union. Two houses further down, the Bloom family. Alan Bloom resides near London. I live in London, comes to Old Grey dinners every year. Across the road, on the one hand, on the one side, the Spoken family, four generations. A little further down, the Kamei family. Jerry Kamei, the pediatrician in Port Elizabeth. His son, Stephen, followed him. One of my best friends, now lives in Toronto, and I visited him a few years ago. So, this school, this town, is at the heart of this family, and uh, it's so wonderful for Stanley, myself, his wife, Dr. Mary Kamei, Dr. Mary Bergman, Mary Kamei. <laughs> On my mind, and um, and uh, I'll mention some other two others here. Yeah. Um, in those days, when boys left home, uh, kind of left home, didn't come back too often. So uh, I left home. I had a fairly good career through the girls. A good scholar, mediocre sportsman, interested in a few things such as history, chess. And interesting enough music, because in those days, music meant nothing more than a cadet band. And in 1957, Robert Selly came. I was already playing outside the school of violin. He persuaded me to 
played up the clarinets. And he taught me the clarinet, the reason being that he wanted to introduce clarinets into the cadet band. I took up the clarinet, I thought, hell of a lot nicer than lugging a heavy rifle in the cadet band and I had the clarinet in the cadet band. Uh, and uh, Stanley followed, he'll talk about his own career, but then we left. And uh, you know, I left home, came home very little. He used to tea, went to the army, went to the community convention here in Sasselburg, studied in the United States, worked in London, 10 years outside South Africa, obviously. And my mother told the following story that, uh, like many mothers, the sons leave, they become empty nesters. It's a little bit tough. Living Linton Road, in those days, cadets was held on a Saturday morning, uh, a Friday morning, and she could hear the bugles on a Friday morning. So she would take herself to the field where the cadets were being drilled, and she would sit on a bench and sob. <laughs> Now, fortunately, um, my best friend, who sadly died too early some years ago, continued to live in Port Elizabeth, but married to others was Dr. Nick Wolf, and he used to spend a lot of time with his wife, with my parents. Uh, his daughter Sonia uh, is my goddaughter. She's here today, so I'm just in the front. Together with my son, I have a son from a second marriage who is a manky rugby player and actually trained yesterday with the, one of the great teams. He's up there somewhere. Um, so uh, the family history is strong with this school, with this town, and uh, it's a very both an honor and an emotion to partake in what we've seen here and with our family's love of music, and I'm quite involved in the world of music, to see this phenomenal um, concert, the Seven Memorial Concert, which few schools anywhere in the world be able to put on. So, a word or two about Stanley. I've done one by another, to quite a bit of speaking. It's a bit, I've never actually introduced my brother, so it's a bit new. Uh, Stanley will talk about his own career and those things that he held important, both at him and in after school. Um, Stanley's a modest fellow, he's not going to sing his own praises. Let me mention two things uh, that I've learned from and about Stanley. Addressing the boys at the junior school, at the uh, senior school this morning, you referred to 10 lessons in life. One of them is the importance of turning up, being there, being there for the sense of if something happens, I'm there, and I can take advantage of the worst that can happen is nothing happens, then I'm possible. But Sandy also is there and turns up for anything that is important in terms of the family, all the various organizations he supports. To fit this into his schedule was extremely difficult, but I said, Sandy, this is important. And Sandy says, it was important, I'm going to be there. Stanley is a big, Stanley accompanied by Mary on big turners up the That's <laughs> Second thing, most important, Stanley will never tell you this, but I will. For most people, the phrase, if I can help, please don't hesitate to contact me, is painful. It's, you know, the throwaway phrase. For Stanley, it actually lives like this. Um, when Somebody, when Stanley says somebody, if I can help, he means if I can help, and he does help. So many people, in so many different ways, not only money, but experience, counseling, assistance in getting into education institutions, etc. And let me introduce Stanley by mentioning one particular incident. There's a school mate of my, a school friend of my son's, who suddenly from one day to the next, contracted a rare form of leukemia. We were somewhat friendly with the parents, which was about two years ago, and in visiting them and consoling them about this terribly tragic situation, I said, look, if it gets to the point where you don't know where to turn, particularly so many things happen in the world of medicine in the United States, um, then you know, I can have a word with Stanley and maybe there's some work. Uh, four months ago, we got a message from the mother, and this family had fallen apart at this tragedy the other day. 
saying there is a trial drug which has been trialed in the United States, and unfortunately the drug, the, the uh, admissions of this drug trial are now closed. We cannot get George onto this potentially life-saving medicine. So I contacted Stanley, uh, and this, this is not an easy business. Pharmaceuticals between countries still on trials and all that's very complicated. We had a relationship with the chief executive of the company, which is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, and within a week or two, a process had been put into place. It's complex. Doctors in America, doctors in the UK, the Federal Drug Administration, its counterpart in the UK, uh, that this boy was able to get this drug. Um, it, he, he made an amazing turnaround. I don't know whether it was going to save his life. But uh, the mother contacted us in a state which you can imagine saying, well, we now have that. So helping uh, is uh, in the nature of Stanley and Marion as well, and uh, perhaps no better way for me to do Stanley but to say, here's a man that has helped a lot of people in that way and made a success of his own life.
admirable. And I know my brother has had a good long relationship with you and your team. And uh, sitting yesterday in the rector's office, uh, I said to myself, if a man like this can volunteer his time, I'm ready to support and uh, we'll go out and talk to other old grey people in the United States. Because one thing I'm sure of, any funds that are raised in the United States will be well handled by you and your administration. So, thank you. It's the old, old protocols observed thing in about one second. Uh, there's one person I do want to recognize, and I don't know where he's sitting, Nigel Bags. Where is Nigel? Nigel, congratulations on your recognition last night. Um, it's been a remarkable journey from Linton Road to what you've done for your community, and in your humble way, it's fantastic, and uh, to you, and see to your wife, everyone, uh, congratulations on what you've done. Keep up the good work. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is the world from the perch that I sit in. Uh, and Mary and I, my wife Marion and I, are sitting in, in New York. And Mary, we've been um, yeah, married for 40 six years or something like that. <laughs> She's my partner in everything, business and uh, labs would be all sorts of stuff. And she also shows up to every family event as my brother can attest to all the things I go to. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the world that I, I, I'm in today, the way I view things from okay, the perch I'm in, and then briefly go through a couple of the the lessons that I've learned over my life that I shared with the uh, high school students earlier on. So, Mary and I were involved in an organization called the World Economic Forum. Uh, there are actually about 150 South Africans that are involved, they come there every year. And the forum, arguably, is the world's largest public-private partnership. It's business people, but it's different religions, NGOs, governments, of course, and uh, your president just uh, joined us this past year without getting involved in politics. Uh, did a very good job at representing South Africa and explaining <coughs> his vision. So, the World Economic Forum was founded by a gentleman by the name of Professor Klaus Schwab, who uh, is quite, um, I'll call a practical intellectual. And he wrote, he has written significantly about what he referred to as the fourth industrial revolution. For those that the history here, of course, you know, the first industrial revolution was uh, when the people left the farming villages in England, in Europe, went into the cottage industries, and a lot of those people ultimately made their way here and became the 1827 the initial, the initial, the first industrial revolution as, as we know it in modern times. Of course, the second was uh, in the early 1900s, Ford and the production of automobiles, the Model T. And then the third we all lived through was somewhere around the 70s, 80s, early 90s, maybe middle 90s, when we experienced the cell phone and the PC. Each one in its own way had a profound impact on society and was brought together and it was communication between the two. But the fourth industrial revolution began, as Dr. Schwab refers to, in the year 2007. And Steve Jobs lifted up the iPhone and he said, this instrument, and it was not the most modest person, but it was true, is going to change everything. And yes, it did. Because it resulted in one thing, intraoperability, which is the connection between the PC, the cell phone, now of course in what we call the cloud, 2007 was purely the internet, and the connection with us through all sorts of devices. And if you go into, for example, an automobile today, that automobile, that car, will have many, many computers in it that we don't even know about. This digitalization of society, the fourth industrial revolution, has had a profound impact on the world in every way you can imagine, as we all know. 
It has resulted, of course, in changes in the way we relate to each other in many respects, the way in which business is operated, and the implications on society is massive. There is huge disruption everywhere you go in the world. Unprecedented change, and we're going through uncharted waters. By the way, I'm going to have something positive to say in a minute, but uh, don't worry. <laughs> it's the societal impact, the economic impact, the political disruption, and make no mistake, there's massive political disruption. I'm not talking about it in the South African context, throughout the world, because of this digital world that we're in. And if you trace in parallel, and uh, I don't need to give a history lesson here, Director Erasmus, but initially, the, the beginning part of uh, the, 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 the 20th century, land was what was important. And then, of course, it moved into capital, accumulation of capital, what was done with capital. And then we moved into <coughs> intelligent machinery. But now, there are two massive important assets in the world that every business person, every institution is going after. The first is talent, and there is a shortage of talent, educated talent. And the second, and this is what I think is so important, artificial intelligence and data. Whoever owns data, in my view, and this was something that Professor Schwab brought to my attention. Whoever owns data will control the world. It's a profound impact. Now, let me just talk about one thing that has impacted all our lives. Because of this fourth industrial revolution, we have massive wealth being generated. The top public companies in the world are all outgrowths of the fourth industrial revolution. Look at them. My company is listed on the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, all these, uh, there's the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, all these new economy companies, the Microsofts, the Apples, and all these companies. They're the top companies in the world. I mean, I think Mobile is still in there, but it's rare, and Walmart is in there, but most, I think eight of the top ten are companies that are outgrowths of this fourth industrial revolution. And Huge wealth has been created. If you go to a place like Silicon Valley in California, you'll see a little, little house. <coughs> Mary and I were there, the taxi driver told us, a small bungalow, and said, that's four and a half million dollars. And then, you go to other parts of the world, like, and I'm referring to the United States, the center of America, you see boarded up stores, you see places where the old economy is not functioning anymore, the analog economy. And this has had profound implications and this is the reason why we've had results in certain elections in the United States, in the UK, in other, in Germany. This fourth industrial revolution will have a profound effect on us and the generations after. So that's, that as a backdrop, and by the way, I mentioned this to the students earlier on, when uh, we were at, uh, um, in high school, uh, those were days when Birds tweeted, right? <laughs> now, we have a president that tweets fake news. <laughs> so, the world has changed a little bit. There are a couple of other areas that, as a business person, I face every day. The first is, believe it or not, the world's economies have not really recovered since the meltdown of 2008. Of course, the economies of the world, on balance, are leaning in a positive direction. But, before September 17, 2017, before Lehman went bankrupt, the world's economies, the run-up period, not exactly the quarter before, but the periods before, were growing at about 4 plus percent. And now the world's economies are growing at about half that. Slightly higher, maybe 2 plus percent. Although I will add, that business people today are more optimistic in the world's economies than I've seen in a long time. Against that backdrop, what is happening, we're seeing massive consolidation amongst the old world companies. Companies are getting together, merging, 
industries are consolidating. Even in the United States, professionals are consolidating. We're seeing massive groups of doctors, dentists, even veterinarians getting together. There are many new business models that have made it into the lexicon in the last five, six, seven, ten years that didn't exist and they have a different capital base. So if you look at Uber and the, the, the outgrowth of the Uber uh, industry, it's the, large, the fastest growing automobile business, uh, uh, transportation business in, in the world. There's nothing that's growing fast actually. Uh, at the World Economic Forum, I happened to be asked by the healthcare group to sit in on the transportation group's meeting. Everybody went around the room introducing themselves. You know, the FedEx is the uh, equivalent in Japan, Germany, etc. But it cost everyone. And um, I'm sitting next to the president of UPS, and the fellow from Uber gets up to, to introduce himself. So I turned to the UPS guy and I said, "What's he doing here? What's he's not friends? He's not in, 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 in logistics." And the, Uber, the, the UPS guy tells me, "Well, yes, he's in passenger transportation." but it's moving into what they call the last mile of delivery. So these are companies that are emerging, I'll go through a few more, that didn't exist. And the most important thing about Uber, they don't need much capital, they don't own the cars. Think about that. Then if you think of the most valuable retailer in the world, it's Alibaba, the Chinese uh, internet company. They don't own one piece of inventory. Different to Amazon, they actually have distribution centers. Alibaba has no inventory needs. And you know that the largest publication operation in the world is Facebook. They don't own any technology, uh, any, any literature. They own the technology. And the fastest growing hospitality business, I'm not sure if they're in South Africa, but uh, it's Airbnb. Well, they don't even own one room. So if you're in a traditional business and you have to have all that capital, you have to compete with these new people. Now, I would say one of the most profound impacts on our world today is consumerism. Because of technology, the internet, the availability of information, I'm sure this has happened to all of us. When somebody in our family, we are diagnosed with something, what's the first thing we do? When we leave the doctor's office, look at the computer. Then we go back to the doctor's office for the next visit, and what do we do? We question the doctor. So, ask my wife if she likes that. She's a medical doctor. I don't think so. But in every single thing in life today, there's this information and ability to make uh, inquiry. And of course, the growth of non-traditional competitors in every market, you know them, this is having a profound impact on business people. The net result is, because of transparency of worldwide pricing, you can get the price on anything you want. And what people do is you go to the department store, you look at something, you like it, you take a picture, and you go and order it on the internet at a lower price. Because of this pricing pressure, we now have pressure on margins, on profits of every kind, every industry in the world, except, of course, the new economy industries, until the second player comes out. The area that is probably the most disconcerting in these changes, and I have some possible views, uh, is the notion of trust. There is an organization, a public relations firm, Edelman, and they publish a trust index every year. It's actually announced every year in January at the World Economic Forum. The level of trust of people in all parts of society is low. Of course, the least trust is in government, everywhere. That's the way, no, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> they taught me at grade to tell the truth, I'm sorry. Don't blame me. Um, and not all, by the way, if you have a government official that's trusted, they get elected time and time again. Uh, so that's the good news. Uh, but the lack of trust in every institution, even in academia, is quite remarkable and has not been seen other than in the last two or three years, four years max. Uh, the good news for the business people is, fortunately, business is amongst the most trusted of the least trusted. <laughs> Think about that. Now, another area in business that we are faced with, and I think you will see it more and more, 
is, and in business people I think will rank this as the number one, is cyber security. It is a huge issue. Um, my company, 10 years ago, no, six years ago, had somebody responsible for auditing the computer, but nothing to do with cyber security. It's whole industry that's emerged perhaps in the last four or five years. And it's a huge tax on business because you have to invest significantly. My company alone gets attacked multiple times in one day. In fact, we've just added a board member to our board, who's the chief technology officer at Harvard. She doesn't know much yet about governance or business, but she's an expert because she has been through personal experience of cyber attacks. And so those are concerns that I see from a business point of view. Business people... I'm not too close to the microphone. But the business people and all of us have two additional areas we need to face and deal with. The first, of course, is the environment. And unfortunately, even in the country we live in, many don't recognize this as the issue. But if we are to leave a world where our kids can live, my grandchildren, Marion's grandchildren, Leslie's, can live a life that we lived, we're going to have to pay more attention to this. And unfortunately, for many reasons, it's become a political football. So, the other area, and uh, again, I don't be too pessimistic, that we need to focus on is pandemics. And we've skirted through this as a world quite well, but viruses no longer stop at borders. You can't stop a virus from moving through a visa. And we got, during the Ebola period, there's such a thing, I think, today as a failed healthcare state, as failed economic states, failed military states, but we now have failed healthcare states. And one of the areas that Mary and I are heavily involved with is trying to bring the attention of government to the fact that there is an issue. And yes, in the US, I think we've got a lot of it under control, but it's not good enough to just worry about yourself, about the country you in, but to worry about these failed healthcare states. And it's a big challenge. So, as I stand here and address you today, the thing that goes through my mind as a business person and through my colleagues is, I'll relate to a little story, and that is, it's been said that the progress we'll make in the next, in the next um, hundred years will equivalent, be equivalent to what the world went through in 20,000 years. Huge amount of change. And so businesses will of course have to respond and will have to become more agile, but also faster at collaborating. And suppliers, people like us that, that distribute products for suppliers, will have to figure out how to collaborate in a very, very rapid way. What does that mean? It means creating relationships even quicker than in the past. And even I see now doing business in Japan, where it can take years and years and years to do business because of the relationship stuff. People are moving faster. And the key is to move faster, collaborate, and be in a position to adopt technology. So speed, interoperability, and everything in demand right away will be important. So those are some of the challenges I see as business people. Against that, what I'm optimistic about is the benefits of technology. When I grew up as the class of, as our class knew, there were no drugs to treat asthma. I had asthma as a young kid. I was sent to Craddock. That was it. Um, cardiology. My, my wife's late father passed away when she was 17 because really there was minimal uh, drugs of course, heart transplants, first conducted here, was on the frontier. But today there are stents which are now actually no longer branded uh, technology products are commodities. So there's enormous progress and the, the amount of technology in the pipeline on 
in the healthcare area is massive. It, I, I tell you, maybe three times a day I hear of new things, and they, they sound so scientific. And I, you know, I'm talking about now, my younger son had to go through a brain surgery. It was about a year and a half ago. And this was like science fiction. They put a tube up his nose into his brain and pulled something out. He was you know, not well for about, you know, I don't know, two, three weeks. He's now playing tennis again a year later. And uh, actually playing so hard that he dislocated his shoulder. But the, the bottom line is there's so much wrong. And to me, the other area that's exciting is the fact that the middle class, and specifically in the developing world, is growing. So on the one hand, we have the dislocation between the wealth that's been created by technology and the alienation of others. But while that is going on, the middle class is growing. And you have it here in Africa, South Africa, of course you have lots of other issues. But the middle class are growing, and the middle class tend to be the stabilizers of society. At the same time, if you think of other demographics, women, the role of women is growing. Very important. Mary went to medical school, I don't remember what the number was, but I think it was about 10, 12% of her class were women, something was enormous. 12% of her class. I happened to be uh, at one of these graduations at, uh, in London, uh, King's College, about uh, a year or two ago, and the majority of graduates were women participated in the WITS uh, graduation ceremony a year ago, and the PhDs, the number of women, a huge number of percent of the, of the PhD graduates were women. And of course, it, it doubles the size of the intellectual capacity available, but it's also a huge stabilizing influence on society. And here's the big one. I have to be careful. I do not want to take away from what the generation of the Second World War did, the great generation, but I, in my heart, believe that the millennials <coughs> are likely to be, and I wouldn't want to say the greatest, because I wouldn't want to take away from the quadrangle of course in, uh, in, uh, at the high school, but they will be remarkable. Their impact on the world is the hope. And I would add, they are socially conscious. My company is a company heavily committed to doing well by doing good. And I will say to you, we are at a huge advantage recruiting young people because they care about the world. And they can drive you crazy with the questions. I make it a point, I travel with a young person, and I make it a point to travel with a millennial. Everything I do is criticized. In fact, I'll tell you a great story. I represent my company at, a, at an award ceremony. Um, yeah, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, in, in London, this is about a year and a half ago, it was just uh, before Christmas. I was a dentist. And the event started about 6 o'clock, and there was liberal amounts of alcohol. So, um, yeah, the, S, the award was coming towards the end of the evening, 9 o'clock, 9.15. I accepted the words and I had my prepared remarks. So I said something funny and no one left. I said something serious, everybody left. So I said, you know what? This is it. Thank you for the award. Appreciate what you're doing. Have a good holiday season. I sat down. So I turned to my millennium. I said to uh, 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 how are those uh, remarks? She's best to be with you. 35 seconds. <laughs> that is the world of the millennials and their values are great, their ability, our grandchildren, my brother's grandchildren, the ability to find any kind of data. They, they don't have to know it or memorize it, but they, they can access it. And that's very, very important. So, the cautionary uh, point here that Professor Schwab speaks about is this profound disruption, this great opportunity, but we have to make sure, as societies, that technologies are used for the benefit of all. And remember, it's not who owns the land so much anymore. If you go to New York, you see all the department stores, they're shrinking. Restaurants are shrinking because people are getting stuff delivered by Uber. The, the big banks are shrinking. But what is so important, what's growing, is companies like WeWorks that offer facilities 
where young people can go in and they can sit at desk for an hour, they can bring their friends in for two hours, access the computer and a social world. Technology, data, information will be far more important than hard assets or capital. So it's the world we're in, it's exciting. So that's the economic message. I don't think I have time to go through, do I have five more minutes to house? It's up to you. So, yes? Okay. Oh boy, that was telling me I speak too much. Um, <laughs> Mike can get up. So, um, here's the lessons I discussed with the students earlier on. Uh, I'm not a big fan of reading leadership textbooks because I think leadership relates to authenticity. If you are sincere, if you treat people well, people will follow you. Um, I'm myself a believer that the best way to run an organization is to go get people smarter than you. And if they see hope, they buy into the vision, which they will help you create as a team, that's a way to drive anything in business. I learned a lot of that here at Gray, where teamwork was of course stressed, as you know. You remember, the first lesson is to, my brother mentioned is, is to show up. It's mathematically <coughs> a great mathematician, but probably 80% of what's needed. Just be there. And you know, people join my company and they ask, how do I get promoted? What do I do? I say, go and do the work no one else wants to do. Just be there to help. And to me, that's at the end of the day. Sorry, I hope you're listening. This is, because this is what's important as you go up in the ladder. So, showing up. I was in survey, I got a cough and uh, you know, jaundice, so I failed survey and had to come back a year later. But my father, busy, my father had a friend who was the, the importer of transistor radios. I don't know, well, maybe people here, the students like with the little puzzle, I don't know what <laughs> transistor radio was. And so I went gave me this radio to play with whatever, and I walked around my father's bowling uh, green or club there with this radio, and a bowler called me and said, what is that, transistor radio? He said, can you tell me where I can buy one of those? So I said, well, I could ask my father's friend. I went to ask him, he said, yeah, you can sell him one of those radios and I'll pay you a commission. Of course, I didn't know what a commission was. A check arrived and, and uh, it was given to my parents for the commission for the selling of the, the uh, radio. What a check was, but I learned. So, the bottom line if I hadn't been there with that radio, there's no way I would have made my first trade at the age of six. <laughs> the second is family values. Family, and I, I, I would, by the way, in our world, Mary and mine, my brothers, family is not blood, family only, it is friendship. Just figure out who you want to work with, who you want to who you want to work with, who you want to spend your time with, and value those friends. So, I have asthma, as I mentioned, and I spent a lot of time, my parents would put me on the train, this milk train going up to the Karoo, to Cradle, because that's where they took care of me, this farm called Dornfontaine, I don't know if anybody remembers, it was a guest farm. And this was the, the height of apartheid, repressive period, and these workers on the farm, and they lived in abject poverty, real, real poverty. But what I learned from them, and I was very fortunate, I had the opportunity to spend time with these workers. As a little kid, I went into their house and did everything. I saw the value of family relationships. And they could get through virtually everything. The circle that they lived under was quite a, a story. And uh, I experienced it firsthand. Not myself, I wasn't subject to it, but I, I saw it and left a lasting impression. Of course, Leslie and I grew up in a, in a family, strong family values, and grandparents lived with us. But family is very, very important in friendship. The third lesson is, you know, you gotta be a salesperson, I'm sorry to tell you, in everything. Rector, headmaster, you gotta sell. You got lots of constituents. You got your students, you got the parents, you got the government, you got the staff, you gotta sell. You gotta be persuasive. 
I learned that lesson when I was nine. So I went to this farm and I tried to persuade the workers to let me drive a tractor at nine. And at the same time to gallop on a horse. I love riding horses and uh, this woman on the farm, if I think about it, was crazy. She had six, seven, eight, she let me ride on the horses without a helmet. But wouldn't do that today. So, and I actually fell one time when I remember being actually unconscious for about a day or so. I think my parents never knew about it. But I mean, <laughs> so, I persuaded them to let me drive the tractor and to ride the horses fast. And I, I, I to, of course, tell my parents, but you, you have to be a salesperson, which takes me to the next one. And this is more to the students I would talk, I would say, and that's global, thinking global. The world is one today. There are physical borders, but everything from a business point of view, from an education point of view, occurs across borders. I can tell you a story there. I'll move on, but uh, uh, I collected stamps and I belong to the PE Philadelphia Philatelic Society as a young person, the German Consul General, Mr. Bilbrey, took me there. And um, I learned about training stamps, and from that I learned at a young age what became very important later in my life. The next lesson is the notion of being a strong summer counselor. I don't know what the equivalent anymore in South Africa is, but in America, kids go to summer camp. And the leaders of the summer camp get everybody to play together. Well, headmaster, rector, if you can get your staff to play together, you're 90% of the way there. And it's all about engagement of everybody in running a better summer camp that gets things done. Then, the next one, number six, is look for mentors. Um, when I came to the States, I was an accountant, not a particularly good one, and I wanted to go into business. I met the Henry Schein family, and their eldest son was my mentor. He believed that a remarkable fellow sadly passed away at a very young age of 49, but he believed in backing young people. He would say to me, you, know, you don't know much, but you're enthusiastic, and I'm going to back you. I'm going to be your sponsor and I'm going to mentor you. I have always had looked for people to mentor me and I've been fortunate enough to find them and I'm a sponge for looking out for people that are interested, certainly in my early career, in younger people. My next one. The most important question in life is the question, why not? I've tried to have a limitless life in terms of answering that question. And, you know, the late Senator Robert Kennedy once said that some men see things the way they are and ask why. I see things that never were and ask why not. And it goes on, if you want a little bit further, the Robert Frost line, which I learned here, two roads met in the woods and I took the one least traveled. And so I, uh, the lesson I learned partially here, partially in my journey, and then was crowned not so long ago when I read this book, Mandela's Ways, it always seems impossible until it's done. And so why not? Then another important part of my education, learned in my parents' store, the Shine family told me this, was the best way to do well is to do good. The combination of social responsibility and business is a huge formula and it's becoming growingly important. Then as I move on, seek out people in life that can help you. And I have a great story about this institution. I was not particularly good at math. I wasn't good at science. Mm -hmm. I was uh, certainly not good at history, not because I wasn't interested, but I remember the dates. All these dates I made us remember. But I met a fellow here that made a profound, had a profound impact on my life. And for those in my class who remember him, um, Mr. Earl, geography teacher. Of course, he taught us whatever we had to know for the syllabus to get to the test. But he 
said to me, Mama Trickia, your handwriting is terrible. You just came, came to go to Alice Institutions University with uh, your handwriting that way. So he, in my last year, Mama Trickia, he made me come in the afternoons and practice my handwriting. He did it in a way that was not humiliating. That was a, 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 a companion to that was when I was a bit. I enjoyed law class. I mean, Thomas Law too had a professor, Ellison Kahn, who actually wrote much of the text, many of the textbook, or the definitive textbook of traditional law for accounting students. And he knew I understood the subject, but he couldn't read my handwriting. So he allowed me to come back to the class, to his office actually, and transcribe my final exam so he could read it. Without <laughs> Mr. Earl and without Professor Ellison Kahn, I would not be here today. Because the two of them gave me the confidence. And I would say, if anyone in this room has a chance to help young people, do it. My tenth lesson is, yes, we get a profound education at grade. I would say I struggled in my education, and one of the teachers actually told me not to bother to go to high school. And uh, I met several students here, former students of my class, who mentioned they failed again. You know, it's important to get, and it has a profound impact on people. It has a very serious impact, psychological impact. What we learn in the classroom is critical. The basics. Because you can't exist in the world without that. But what we learn on the playing field of life, using the education we learn as the basics, is more important. But you can play unless you're literate. So the two go hand in hand. And so taking advantage of the playing field of life is okay. And uh, I didn't tell the students this, but I'll tell you this, and I hope that the two of you respect this a bit. But it's okay to question your teachers. In our world, we couldn't. I'm not saying you need to go as far as my brother was talking earlier on, as it goes in America because teachers, I wouldn't want to be a teacher in the New York school system because they constantly bombard with questions and uh, if the students don't agree with the teachers, they say it in class. So that's, you know, the politeness here of course is great, but the ability to question is important. So here is my final lesson that I learned, it's number 11, it's the 10 plus number 1. You ready? It's all about people. People drive everything. And I would say that if you can have a vision as I started out, and people believe you, and believe you that's maybe a little bit extreme, a tad, a tad, not realistic. Maybe I was a lot unrealistic. But people like the journey, and they trust it. And so if you, and go out and develop trust and be authentic and work with people that will be and help people reach their ambitions and even if they make more money than you don't be upset my, my father my brother and i learned this in our parents store where we work with these people from every walk of life so i thank you for this opportunity to speak with you uh, thank you to everyone in the class it was an amazing experience being a grey boy. Having said that, I did not really appreciate it until this weekend. Because in the last 24 hours, it was transformational as to the connecting the dots of what happened in the classroom here, what I saw these kids are doing, my life, and how they all came together. So the two of you working with the old grades, raising money for this institution, the people running this institution today, the work you're doing is phenomenal. Highly unappreciated when you're a student. Highly unappreciated probably for 20 years as you're struggling up the economic ladder or whatever. But in retrospect, it was remarkable. And Mr. Mayor, keep up the good job in running the Windy City that is so clean. Thank you.
nothing that I can say but wow. What a privilege it's been able uh, to be able to listen to you this morning, Stanley. And I'm sure that wherever you find yourself in the world, people want a piece of you. This is just a small token from us. Uh, and two little chaps have been selected up the grade one to hand it over to you. Thank you.